will trickle in. So first, I would just like to welcome everybody. This is Game Power's fourth career advice uh, webinar series. Um, and we're thrilled about the response we've been getting. And we're so excited about the amazing caliber of guests we've been getting. Today is obviously no exception. Um, as a reminder, for those of you who um, don't know me, my name is Allison Schwartz and I'm helping Game Power. Game Power is a new platform that is designed to be a networking space for those of us in, the, in progressive politics. If you have not set up your profile yet, please head over to gamepower.org and get your profile set up. Um, this platform really is what you make of it. Um, and it's a great place to tell us more of what you're looking for, um, what other guests you would like. I'm sorry about my background noise. Um, so please head over and make a profile. Um, I'm gonna start with introducing our interviewers. Um, some of you may have seen them in the past couple of weeks. So first we have Aviant Obi. Um, Hey, Aviant, and Josie, Josie Schreier. Uh, Aviant goes to Wellesley, and Josie is at Howard University, and we're really thrilled. We're just starting the, uh, the Aviant and Josie uh, webinar show. So welcome, you're in on the ground floor. Um, last off, um, I really am so thrilled today to introduce our featured guest. Um, Carrie Pugh is the Senior Director of Campaigns and Elections for the National Education Association. Uh, she's led the NEA's political department since 2015. Um, and for those who do not know, NEA is the nation's largest union with 3 million members who live in every single congressional district in the country. So just a little bit of reach. Um, and to talk a little bit about her job, she leads NEA's state and national political strategy, member engagement, ballot initiatives, independent expenditures, state legislative campaigns. Again, just so you're not busy, really. Not, not, not a lot going on for you. Um, but Carrie has nearly three decades of electoral community organizing in her governmental experience. So she really brings a ton, um, not only to us in the progressive movement, um, but, you know, she is helping to make um, really our world um, and our country a better and more equitable place to live and raise and educate our children. So with that, I'm going to turn over the uh, microphone to Josie and Aviant to ask the questions. Um, well, I'll start off with saying hi. How are you? Um, how did you get your start in politics? Um, my start in politics. Um, I was actually not one of those students on campus who was like in college Democrats or, or any of that. Um, in 1996, there was a lot going on and still a lot going on in the country around anti-immigration work. Prop 187 was hot and alive in California. Um, there was then called the welfare reform and you know, a major impact on immigrant families and immigrant seniors. I was working at an organization called Chinese Mutual Aid Association in Chicago on Argyle Street and doing social services. Um, but you would see uh, seniors and members on the community come in confused and in tears about the impact um, of public policy on their lives. And we started organizing and organizing and I just kind of got the bug. I realized that so much of our focused, um, the people who were our targets, who were pivotal in changing the conditions and what was happening to the community there were politicians. And so I decided, you know, we've all done this. I'm gonna go inside and learn from the inside and I'm gonna come back out. And I just never really came back out. Um, but I uh, started to ask around and I um, got, hired to work for then my first political job was um in lisa madigan's state senate race and with speaker mike madigan and i just i never left <laughs> um well what like what were some of the critical decisions that um made you shift towards education specifically oh gosh um so much I, you know well first of all i would just out I, I was at seiu the Service Employees International Union before I went to NEA. And I've been at NEA since 2007. And I just, like, I feel so lucky that 
I get to get, I get to do campaigns and policy and advocacy, but like fight the good fight every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, part of it was, and a career opportunity in 2007, the NEA um, reorganized um, and created a new political shop. And then uh, a mentor of mine and a friend, Karen White, um, started it and recruited me to come over. And I just felt really lucky um, because education to me is a game changer. Um, it is the equity thing that um, regardless of what zip code you live in, can make a difference, right? The, the gift of education, that touch from an educator. And um, I just kind of like politics. I got hooked and never never left because it's so important. And now I have two kids and, um, and now we're all at home in the pandemic. And um, I get to fight for educators and education every day, but dear God, <laughs> like being at home, spending a day in the classroom, chaperoning a field trip hats hats off right to the, to the hard work that um that is done so yeah that, that's you know one of the big drivers and one of the things i love about working in education to be able to combine my love for something that really matters along with like the good fight and the good guys with the union yeah i mean my mom's a teacher too and she's like in a webinar right now about um she <laughs> Students, they got mischievous and they're kicking other students out of class. So she had to do a webinar on how to not, how to stop people from doing that. Um, so yeah, like dealing with the pandemic is crazy. Um, but yeah, as you were rising through the ranks, did you um, experience any resistance um, in your career um, from other people, from colleagues or other people in your life? Oh, sure. I mean, where do you start? <laughs> um, you know, a little subtle things. I was, um, you know, from joining a, a campaign staff and on day one you meet people and they're like, you're China man. And you're like, what? And they're like, well, who, who sent you? How'd you get the job kind of thing, right? Um, you know, um, oh, and I'm in the middle of it. And my daughter is, Gracie, say hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, I don't want to, I mean, look, we all have different, um, different challenges in our career. I would just say that, um, there certainly were things that I think, and you've heard, like, we, it's, it wasn't unique to me, but, you know, you say something in the room and you're kind of overlooked and next thing somebody else says something and it's the exact same thing you said and it's like oh that's brilliant right um so certainly i mean stories for days around mm -hmm. those kinds of things um but you know we we step up and we get back up and we and we learn from it um did it like bring up any feelings of like imposter syndrome in you every day what time is it it's 507 I don't know at about four o'clock today <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so yeah so I guess my question is more um how have you dealt with the feelings of imposter syndrome as you've been in your career I mean you we all work at it and I think you know you leave a meeting you leave an activity you leave an event you leave a job interview and you think well that didn't land right or um, people didn't, you know, didn't treat you in that, in a certain way. And so you question, did I not make sense? Did, um, I not articulate it right? Was it dumb what I said, you know, or was it more about them? Right. And their implicit bias mm -hmm. and how they, the assumptions they made about you when you walked in the room for the event or you know, sat around the table, right? Like we can recreate that. Um, and honestly, that never, that never goes away. Um, different strategies, right? I mean, first of all, um, I always say success be breeds success or confidence breeds confidence, right? You walk into a room and people listen to you and you command it. To, and then, it, and it's, it's, um, it's confidence building. And for many of us, myself included, women, women of color, um, you know, that's not the experience. That's often the, 
anomaly more so than the experience. And so it makes you feel like, you know, even when you put yourself into a conversation, sometimes it's like, I mean, and you'll see it like you guys, I'm sure you can think about conversations or meetings and some people talk quieter, other people kind of wait to be called on and others just like are right in there and they're, they, they aren't a, they don't seem to ex exhibit the same amount of fear. Fear is probably not the right word, but you know. I guess. Like restraint with a better word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I'll ask people, sometimes you'll debrief a meeting, right? And like, that's been, the, you know, things that have worked for me in whether I was 25 or 30 or 45. Um, role playing a conversation in advance, getting your thoughts together, you know, your own uh, speaking or, you know, presentation strategies, but also then also realizing and having the confidence to realize, you know what, sometimes it's like, it's actually more about them than it is about you. Mm -hmm. And like, it's what out of your head, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't carry it into your head when you walk into the room. Right. So what advice do you have, like, to differentiate whether it's you or them, even though might be them more often than you. But how do you? <laughs> I mean, it's so so. Um, the question that you just put, right? Like, I think that's like the fact that I that I said that, and that you know, it's just that is that's our in our own head of what we're dealing with. Like, why are we even thinking that way? Look, I presented a good idea. It didn't go so well, right? Like, I think just getting it out of I, I'm. I've tried to move past whether it was me or them <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. Um, so, so going back to like your, your specific job, um, what, what does it entail? Can you tell us about the National Education Association overall and what your specific duties are? Yeah. I mean, as Allison said, um, we're the largest union in the country. country. We represent 3 million educators. Um, bus drivers, food service workers, um, custodians, higher ed, technology technicians, you know, um, cafeteria or um, school nurses, et cetera. Um, so our job is, look, we're not the party, we're not the candidates, but we know that policy um, is made by public officials. So um, we evaluate where decisions are going to be made um, and we play in those election strategies to elect people who are going to be public education champions on any number of our issues. Um, we also work, um, you know, we're never going to have the same amount of resources to go and, you know, fight um, the other side with their millions and billions of dollars, but we have um, something you can't buy, right? Like we have educators who are trusted and beloved, right? Your, your mom, um, who everyone knows um, in communities. And we work a lot on building um, our capacity within our own membership and within our own infrastructure um, to raise their voices and to be effective um, advocates back home and local and state and in communities. Mm -hmm. And these people who get elected, um, what do you, what steps do you think they will take to undo the damage caused by this current administration? Uh, well, first of all, when we're successful in November, I think one of the biggest things we can do is um, hope that, or is cheer, I don't think we have to help cheer on Joe Biden and Kamala Harris when they fire the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, on day one. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, we also, um, we have a program at NEA called Sea Educators Run that we launched back in 2017. Um, and it was really thought of as, um, there weren't a lot of um, candidate organizations that were training candidates at the school board at the municipal level, where a lot of education decisions were being, were being made. Um, and we thought we could be kind of that gateway at the very local level for educators um, to step up and to run for office. Um, so that, I mean, that's the other thing that we're doing. And for those that followed the Red for Ed movement back in 20, in the spring of 2018, that 
doubled and tripled our own interest at NEA of educators who wanted to run for office. And we had to stand up an entirely par a, a parallel track for people who wanted to run for state legislature as well. So we still kept the keep and, and had the local level, but there were, I think like in 18 alone, 1800 educators on the ballot for state house and state senate across the country. That's amazing. <laughs> right, like, it, yeah. it, I mean, look, they're not all any NEA members, um, you know, and some of them are, you know, superintendents or principals. Mm -hmm. I mean, it broad umbrella around educators, but yeah. Um, so that's also part of, you know, what we are working on and um, just really excited about seeing that those, um, those educators who are stepping up. And if we have those ranks, like we all know, right, in the candidate pipeline as well, right? So if, I think there was like 1,089 that were, that were elected in, in 2018. Um, so hoping that they move up as well in the candidate pipeline and are, you know, join the ranks of statewide officials and members of Congress, et cetera. So, okay. Currently, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that are facing the NEA? The pandemic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Outside of the pandemic. Was, oh. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I should have clarified. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I think budget shortfalls, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that really was um, the fire behind what we would say was not a moment, but a movement, the Red for Ed strategy, right? Like you can't continue to cut and to cut and to shortchange um, education budgets and have um, reasonable class sizes or um, the kinds of supplies that um, that kids need. On average, our members, and the or not just our members, but the average educator mm -hmm. spends $1,800 out of their own pocket on school supplies, right? Um, yeah. So, right, and, and, and I mean, I'm sure you have stories for your, from your mom. What grade does she teach? She teaches special education for kids in late elementary school, but um, yeah, I just remember teachers having to fundraise to bring in supplies to their own classrooms. Yeah, so budget, right, budget cuts, I mean, and obviously um, that impacts the kind of facilities our kids go to school in, too. Yeah. I mean, all of that, right, and like, they know the kind, you know, they, they're not blind to the conditions, you know, with broken chairs and mold and mildew and holes in the seal, right? I mean, so budget um, shortcuts are um, definitely a huge issue outside of the pandemic, but exacerbated by the pandemic that educators face. Um, and I think just, you know, overall, um, the ability to use their expertise to deliver the kind of programs that our students deserve that isn't um, necessarily teaching to a test all the time. Not that we are anti-test, right? Like educators invented tests. But that said, um, mm -hmm. what's the right mix? Um, and do we have enough time? And do they have a spirit of expertise and autonomy to um, really get at the critical learning and the critical questions that we want our students um, to have? Mm -hmm. And so things right. So like, what's happening in the profession? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But as for things that were exacerbated by the pandemic, um, what changes do you think would be permanent? Um, and do you think there are going to be any good changes or any like negative changes that would be permanent? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, You know, I, I do, I, I think that there are inequities um, that have existed long before, right, the pandemic. Um, you know, um, Wi-Fi access, computer, like all, all of that. Um, again, greatly exacerbated by the pandemic, um, just exposing um, that gap. Um, I'm you know, hopefully, I think we're at this cri twin crisis of um, the, all the bad things, right, in terms of unemployment, um, the social and economic stress, um, you know, 
and it's not the same to deliver to deliver or to receive you know information and education online mm -hmm. um that said there's also i think just culturally the whole country has pivoted to um just cultural change but you know all the zoom meetings the conversations were right like and so i i guess i the positive thing i think will be um hopefully when we get back that we really get back not to the way that it used to be but something better and that the combination of a true crisis along with an appetite and a demonstrated universal experience for cultural change will open up things um so that we're really better and you think cultural change might include better pay for teachers? You think this is a good moment to advocate for that? Well, we're going to advocate anyway. And let's face it, right? Like it is a female-led, a overwhelmingly female um, profession. Um, so that's part of it. Um, but I mean, I hope so. I hope so, right? There, you know, um, the retirement security and um, higher salaries, and you know loan forgiveness like the whole the whole package mm -hmm. right making it be um a an appealing profession that people can go do good stuff but actually and not have to work two and three jobs right yeah um yeah uh sorry so stepping back from the pandemic Thinking about your mom are you <laughs> yeah i know i just i got really <laughs> caught up in that yeah because she's been like searching for a second like everything you're saying is just spot on for everything that my mom's been dealing with. So like you're saying that I'm like, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, and there are so many special things about educators, but you know, special ed, I mean that um, distance, like the, the stories that we have heard, um, and I'm sure that you can share about how hard this pandemic has been. I mean, on for everybody, but many of, of our students and most you know, in the in most need, most in need, sorry, um, special ed, um, you know, our LGBT community, right? I mean, there's so much um, about learning that happens in our school buildings. Yeah, it's, and teaching special education that is so important to have in a school building. So it's very tricky to, for all of us, I guess, especially right now, but, um, yeah, as I was saying earlier, stepping back from the pandemic um, and going back to your job, um, what skills do you think are needed best? Uh, what best skills do you think are needed for your job to perform your job? Um, sorry, phone. Um, skills, most management skills. I think that's one of them, um, and I I say that because. I run our campaigns and elections department. I'm our political director and campaign after campaign after campaign, what's rewarded and the skill set is not exact right to, to win, to understand budgets, to like when you are on a race for six months, nine months, 18 months, the management side of running a department or an organization is not exactly what's honed in short term situations. So, I mean, I think one, just underscoring moving from a campaign to um, doing political work in an organization that um, management skills is certainly one of them. Um, budgeting, right? Um, you know, trying to figure out your sequencing, your cash flow, um, the different uses of, of dollars and, um, and also just campaign evaluation, right? Now, whether that's a um, an issue fight from some experience that you've had on around climate or wage wages or, or whatever, right? But understanding um, and being able to make smart decisions about where you spend and on what and how to evaluate your return on investment um, because there's never enough money. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also think maybe it's not a skill set, but um, it, it's what makes you successful is not being afraid to have people who are smarter than you hi hiring people that are smarter than you mm -hmm. right like not having that insecurity and also you know um giving 
those people opportunities to learn and to shine, which I guess is also part of the management side of things. But I don't, I don't want to be responsible for all of it. I want, I, you know, like in, in this, in my job, there's a lot of just like facilitation or decision making best on, bet, based on people who are smarter on um, understanding um, the poll numbers or the data that is there or on buying on digital or like all of those things. Um, I think that's something that's um, important that we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. And with all these skills, what would you say is your superpower? Oh. <laughs> um, I would say, um, one, um, not being um, insecure or afraid to hire people that are smarter than you on certain things and letting them shine. Um, and um, asking, you know, asking the tough questions. Uh, the other superpower, gosh, that's a hard question. Um, positioning, pos positioning people, positioning organizations, positioning principles. Um, and I think it's something um, that uh, is, you know, is probably a good skill to step back and, and to unpack because I think it's relevant in a lot of different experiences, no matter what kind of industry that you're in. Um, and I would just say I'm behind the scenes a, a ton, um, but the strength of the relationships that I built with people like Allison or Amy Pritchard or others over, over the years. Hopefully they, they, that would, hopefully they would say that's my superpower too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, managing and positioning is not necessarily something that, you know, is, comes natural to people. Like, so when do you think you discovered you had this superpower? Um, 30 seconds ago. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the superpower or, or the, um, around, thinking about hiring people that are smart, probably about five years ago when I became the department director, right? Like, you know, they always say, what is the saying that um, the skill set or what you did to get to the job you're in is not, one of the hardest things is to unlearn that and to let it go because that's often not the same skill set for the job you just got promoted to, mm -hmm. right? And like, that rings so true and is like, it is so incredibly challenging. But yeah, I would say like five years ago, I had to really think about um, when I leave the, this job, what, what will have been mine um, that, I, that I feel good about that I uniquely contributed? And then how do I get there? And um, just realizing how important it is to have people that um, are just, super, super smart and smarter than you. <laughs> and for those people, I mean, who would you say is the most powerful woman who's impacted your life and your career? Oh gosh. Um, I don't have a most, I have so, I've, you know, I, in three decades, I mean, there's been a journey, right? Like we've all had I've had dozens and dozens of small moments with huge impact that I will never forget. Um, and I have so much loyalty towards, um, I mean, I can think of a dozen people. Um, I have an identical twin sister, Courtney, um, and you know, we cheer each other on and we talk each other up and give each other grace. And she's probably, when things are really, really hard um, or you're feeling overwhelmed or unconfident or whatever that is, um, that's my go, that's my go-to person <laughs> right there. Um, but I can think about like, there was this woman, Dr. Brenda Green, when I was a student at Ball State University and she was the director of the OMSA, Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. Um, and, you know, back in the day, I, you know, I, smoked in, in college. And I just remember going there and just being, you know, sitting there and stressed out. And it was just somebody who helped, helped out during a hard time, who um, also was 
super empowering about my own identity. Mm-hmm. Where I grew up, there were very few Asian American students and there were no, there was not an organization on campus. And so I, I think she helped to find my voice really early on and, you know, small moments a long time ago, but it builds on um, who you are and seeing yourself in an affirmed way and, you know, the power to make a difference in small ways. Right, right. And like you being a minority, me being a minority, um, and being in an industry dominated by women, um, what do you, steps do you think we can take to dismantle systemic racism? I feel like oh. we have sexism first. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. Like, we got drinks, do we have hours? Like, what, like, Let's, let's do it. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there's so much. I mean, first of all, just kudos again, you know, to you and to Josie and Allison and Amy and everybody, because part of it is a support network, mm-hmm. right? Um, not being alone. The other part of it is um, using your power and Aviance, we all have it, no matter what stage, whether we're a high school student or whether it's, um, whether it is uh, on a college campus, your first job in a small organization, your big, your big job in a big organization, we have the power to use our power and to dismantle the system as it is, Mm -hmm. right? So I think it's about being intentional, being strategic and being intentional about that conversations like this is where the strategy gets played, being intentional, um, you know, being intentional about doing that, I think is really, really important. Um, One of the things that I've seen people do for me, and I have tried as I can um, in my own um, hiring ability at NEA and our consultant practices and um, boards that I've sat on with other organizations is to create stretch opportunities for people of color. Mm -hmm. And I say that, like, indulge me for like a a minute here. I was on campaign after campaign after campaign, just like any other young, you know, younger person, right? You know, you go and you um, live in someone's, you know, donor housing, et cetera. What has happened, and and I think there's good change that that has happened recently, but Cycle after cycle, we see a person of color walk in and guess what positions we get? We get outreach, constituency outreach, or politics. So we basically get to handle people, right? Like constituencies. Um, And the challenge around that is we may do our own time, two cycles, six years, but if that is all that we have done, I'm not saying that that's unimportant. Don't get me, don't, I don't mean to sound that way at all. I mean, those are the jobs that I by and large had. But most times those, those positions, they don't have department, they don't have budgets. They're not looking at polling or voter contact or making hard decisions about how much on digital, how much on spend. They're not doing rapid response. They're not figuring out the message. They're not managing people meaning staff, they're handling constituencies. And guess what? We did our time, but then that next opportunity where you are in that job, the things I'm looking for, people who understand how to evaluate campaign budgets, who understand debt, like all of those skill sets are not the experience. So I say that to say um, that is the reality. And along my way, I've been given stretch opportunities for jobs probably I felt like on paper and in my experience, I was not as qualified as some of the other counterparts, but someone gave that to me and I rose up because a lot of people, you give them the opportunity and guess what, they rise. And I can think of examples that I've done that. Um, and I think that that is um, something very specific that many of us can do all along the way and that will make a difference. Okay, so for my last question before I turn over to Josie, um, I want to talk about the main um, campaign now. Uh, There's a lot of attention that's focused on Senator Kamala Harris, her gender and race. Um, How significant is that for you and for the NEAs as as well? Um, uh, I mean, it's so affirming. I'm, I'm just, 
super excited that um, that Kamala, a woman of color, is on on the ticket. Um, there was something during the convention I remember posting about it, and it was um, it was the the night that Kamala spoke, and I saw, and I actually I had paused because I I I didn't expect to be um, so taken aback. Okay, I, I almost got I almost cried. There were um, South Asians and immigrants and see like the images that were there. I can't even describe like. I just felt affirmed and I felt like I saw myself and I didn't, it took me back to, I, so I, I'm 49, um, took me back to when I grew up in the seventies and you know who my favorite, um, Barbie Dow and the, my favorite show was, it was Sonny and Cher mm -hmm. because Cher was the only person I saw on mainstream TV that looked like me. She had long black hair. I saw nobody else that looked like me. And I, I had that like steaming sense of like pride, but like that, um, that feeling that goes really, really deep. Mm -hmm. And it took me back to the seventies. And like, I was seeing Cher again. I know, I know that's, and I don't mean to um, make fun of it. Like, I just, I think it is incredible um, mm -hmm. to have Kamala on, on the ticket mm -hmm. and, um, that's my sentiment besides the fact that like, all of her qualifications she is fierce she is smart she is prepared she is a bad i mean like all of those things um but just personally seeing her just and um the images and her story that her story is just as american as joe biden's story um is um has, has meant meant a lot and has hit me in a way i didn't actually expect i cannot express how much I relate to that exact same feeling, but um, I can't keep going on. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can really keep going, but um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Josie for um, the audience questions, but it was really lovely to talk to you. Nice talking to you too. Thank you. Oh, all right. So before we get into audience questions, uh, we have a few more career advice questions. So, a lot of people have been asking about getting into politics mid-career. What is your advice for people looking to change their career to politics? Do it. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's great. Um, I think that um, we, I, I, you don't realize enough the experiences that might come from a policy shop or um out of technology or right like all these skill sets especially now i feel like from a campaign context we are using so many more mediums there's organizing but there's um um there's the digital piece there's mail there's narrative and there's all there's so much more which also is like that much more exhausting but um there's so much more that is shaping and that can get um, that can get uh, operationalized when it comes to campaigns. And you know, if you're going to make a career a career change like that um, midway, then have at it because there's also a lot of us that are like, oh my god, I'm exhausted. <laughs> And to follow that up, would you tell someone just starting their career the same thing or give them some different advice? No, I, I, I mean, here's what I, campaigns are hard. They are exhausting. They are relentless. You are responding to things out of your control, right? Like it is not for everybody and it is hard to sustain that level of, um, as many of us know, right, that level of being on all the time because your life isn't necessarily your own. Um, but I, I do, and sometimes people joke like it's a younger person's game, but um, I, I, what I do think is there are a lot of skill sets that come out of that. And um, particularly when it's more entry level where you can really, um, if you have the luxury um, to be able to, do something in a smaller venue or in a smaller race. I actually think that that's in some ways probably a better experience because you kind of get it all. You know what I mean? Like at, at, at an entry level, you're going to see a little bit of the fundraising. Like it's like 
the difference between running or a school board race or a governor's race, right? Like it, things are highly specialized, bigger budgets um, on a governor's race, but like a school board race and when you're just starting out, something like that, like I feel like you get to experience things that are you really like and you enjoy, things that you might be really, really good at. And even if you hated it, it's kind of like the whole kitchen sink is thrown at you. And so you have a, in some ways, I think a good um, experience to make more robust decision-making in other kinds of environments. Oh, this actually trans, uh, transitions perfectly to my next question. If someone is interested in education advocacy, besides working at a union, where else could someone be impactful to work on education policy? Um, a lot of places. Uh, think tanks, there are a lot of um, really great uh, think tanks and policy organizations, right? Because there's so, there's so much that is, when we, I mean, the ed policy bucket is such a big, um, a big space, right? So I think think tanks, um, I think the administration, you know, not just the federal administration where decisions are made, but also even um, local administrations, right? Like your mayor's offices, your governor's offices. Um, there are a lot of decisions um, that end up getting made by um, public officials in education. So that would be the other place. Um, and then I would also say foundations. There have been a lot of foundations that have been involved in a myriad of education issues. Um, if you want to look at, if you also want to do ed policy, I think there, it's a pretty, um, I think a pretty broad space to have um, to have an impact in. And then obviously, if you want to do something directly within a school system, a, a, an administration, superintendent, you know, or, or and or directly at a, in a school. Well, before I turn over to audience questions, um, I'd like to ask, what do you wish someone had warned you about before you chose this career path? Oh. Um, how um, relentless that, that it can be sometimes. I, I joke and I say, I remember when, um, and I can't, I'm like, I can't see Amy, but come on, you remember when we used to get like the hotline facts to us every day and somebody would Xerox copy it or when somebody would, like it was somebody's job, usually one of your, our entry level jobs where you'd clip the local newspaper and like cut and paste and like make copies. Because literally my first job was like faxing <laughs> the Washington Post to the Boston headquarters of the Dukakis campaign because they would otherwise not be able to see the paper. <laughs> right. So, but now I just wish somebody would have told, right? Like it's like, oh my God, did you see it on the Twitter feed? And it was on Facebook and it was on Instagram. It's like, there's so much to consume um, and so many different platforms that we are moving campaign messaging on. It's just, um, on the one hand, it's the, di the dynamism of it is um, like, we love it, right? I mean, it's a lot of fun and um, I'm as competitive as the next person, um, but it's also, I, sometimes I wish for the days of, well, that was in the hotline and they did a press conference at five o'clock and we're gonna stand something up at nine because like those days are long gone. <laughs> Well, um, Ruby Zimmerman asks, I'm really interested in working in education policy. Would you say that most positions in this career path, uh, working for a think tank, NEA or Department of Education, would need a master's degree in public policy or something else? Um, I think it depends on where you are in your career, but I would say no. I mean, I would also say um, for people when we reopen the building back up, I mean, um, like we have had, we have a great intern program, for example, at NEA. Um, I will tell you that many, many of our interns have ended up being hired back to the organization, right? Um, so I, I don't think you have to have a, a master's degree. I mean, certainly that's something to aspire to, um, but you can do really great things. And also just from an experience level also, um, 
and, you know, and a field aspect without a master's degree as an entry point. I mean, I would, I'm sorry, the, the only other point that I would say there is um, on education policy, you know, there is just, there's so mu much that we value about, which is why, about having educators who have that experience. It's one thing to talk about testing and to talk about what we need our kids what the level to perform at. It's another thing to actually see how you manage that in a classroom with three kids on an IEP, um, a transient population, right? Like, you know, the, the social and economic realities. Um, also, while teaching people to be confident, curious learners um, who can be critical thinkers, right? And sometimes you just have to see it and experience it. And I see you shaking your head. <laughs> you said IEP, and I was like, I know that. I know that one. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's, I'm not supposed to use all the jargon. Yes. <laughs> we have an anonymous question. What is the danger of elected officials using COVID-19 as an excuse for privatizing education? Um, I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, there. There's a, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I mean, in so much as the administration has, has suggested that with some of the, the resources, right? Um, look, there's, if people opt to go into private school, like, and have the, then that, have the means, and that's, that's, that's your choice. But, I mean, it's kind of like the boutique chains and the malls. The vast majority of our, students are in our nation's public schools. Um, and those schools are already shortchanged with the resources that they need from an equity standpoint. And I don't mean equal, I mean an equitable standpoint. Um, and that's the biggest danger. Very important distinction. <laughs> um, Cindy Sue asks, what has been your experience of balancing being a mother while working in politics? Um, I have a good partner, um, which always, which, which is important. Um, you know, we, we make it, we make it work. Um, you know, it's, 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 I guess I would say the other thing is, is that while the hours are really long, I mean, I've been lucky um, to most times be able to work in, in, in a dynamic that at least the flexibility is there, right? Um, not every organization is that way. And I hope, I hope that um, just as, you know, a boss as well, that I've exhibited those same things, right? Um, in that, you know, people say it's fine to go to a PTA meeting or to be there and volunteer for your kids, um, field trip, but really they're rolling their eyes and saying slacker, right? Like the fact that I'm not um, in that kind of environment and I hope that the team that I lead um, doesn't feel like we are in that same environment, um, I think is one of the most important things. And just giving people grace, you know, especially now. Look, we have, for those of us that have kids, they're at home with us, right? Hi, like talking. <laughs> Yeah, this is especially important, pandemic aside, because as you mentioned, the education field is pretty dominated by women. Um, how can progressive organizations support parents better so that we can retain talent and grow in our careers while fulfilling our life goals? Well, and here's where I, I wonder, kind of thinking back a little bit to one of Aviance's questions, is that I do think that the one of the forced like quick cultural changes that the pandemic has universally put us into is I think a greater acceptance of non-traditional work hours, right? Um, a uh, greater acceptance of um, rem some level of remote. I mean, it's not always the same, but remote working work working environments. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the, part of the 
um, part of the issues that will make it a more welcoming place for people with children to be able to do really good work, right? To have that flexibility. It doesn't mean you're not still hitting a deadline. It doesn't mean that you're working less hours, but a different kind of acceptance um, and flexibility in some cases. Steven Scavione asks, one of the things that the right does well is to organize discontent into electoral dividends. How can the left also organize discontent and what issues can we organize around? Well, um, first of all, <laughs> oh, so much there. Okay, first of all, I think we have to be careful not to take the bait, right? Um, I mean, that's not exactly the question, but we're, they are baiting us sometimes to fall into things is one thing. Um, the second thing, and I will just say this, is as part of not taking the bait is also not amplifying the discontent or the isms that they are putting out there and spouting. So for example, some of the stuff that we're seeing talked about with the, um, you know, the protest movement or um, the, the looting and the rioting or the isms thrown against Kamala um, is not to retweet and reamplify what they are saying or their tweets. Um, but I do think, right, like um, maybe discontent isn't the word that um, exactly the right word, but you know, we have to um, not be afraid to push back and to, or, and to organize back. As Democrats, the great thing is we're a big tent. As Democrats, we often suck at you know, we can't just push back on a bumper sticker and stay on message half the time. Like we want to, you know, give 15 different reasons and everyone gets lost in the conversation. Um, so don't take the debate, take the bait. Don't reamplify the isms and the lies and the misinformation that they are spewing. Um, and to push back with our own very strong message and to connect the right dots, but plain, plainly and simply. That's amazing. Me and Aviance actually talk about not taking the bait all the time, but um, circling back to more general career advice, when you were already in a position, how did you decide when the right time to leave was? Sorry, <laughs> I almost put my water out because I'm thinking, why well, wasn't always graceful at that? <laughs> um, I, you know, this might sound corny. I, it, I do it all the time and it's advice I give. I make pros and cons lists. Um, I make lists for days. Um, I find quiet times and I have my own rituals, you know, nothing, whatever, you know, when people are doing New Year's Eve resolutions, I'm doing like pros and cons lists. Um, but I think it really is um, thinking about and being methodical and thoughtful and honest about what you want to do with your life, um, the things you like, the things you don't like, the skills that you have, the skills you don't have, right? Like there, and that's why I like, I make lists all the time, but I think stepping back and creating a space for yourself to do that is really important. And then sometimes I think just finding the courage, right? Like a lot of people, a lot of people stay in environments because, um, and it's a luxury in many cases, right? Let's let's be let's be clear. Sometimes this is like you know first world world challenges. Not everybody has that luxury. Um, but I guess also just when you realize that the job or the career or the employer that you're with is not exactly um, what's getting you up every day, ready to hit the ground running. Um, and it's not exactly growing out the skills that you want. Then you also have to the courage to say, it's time to try something else. And I also think on that, that doing that creates opportunities and space for other people, all those smart people that you brought in um, that deserve that opportunity too. One person asks, where would you look for a job right now if you had 20 years of experience in higher education at a four-year public institution in both undergrad and grad admissions and financial aid expertise? 
Um, this person comments, they like to put their knowledge to use advocating for students, even if at a nonprofit or on a campaign. Oh, wow. Um, I think it depends on where, you know, like where you are, are you in the DC area or right? Like kind of what's around you. Um, I think foundations are doing um, incredible things in, um, in this space. Um, I think that um, if you have a background to be able to get into, um, even in your own state, like the governor's office and into the administration on a board or a commission, boards of regents, right? Um, I think that that's a space. The other thing, um, and this is hard to answer because I don't actually, like there are all these questions I want to ask this person and I'm happy to talk afterwards too, directly. Um, I think one of the most interesting spaces that we have yet to really lean into is career tech um, and community colleges. So if you are, you're already in higher ed, I mean, I, like for so many reasons, um, but I think that that is a growing space with a lot more potential um, and um, I, I think that, that that is, and I think more resources have gone into there as well. I think that's another interesting space to look into. Sorry, I feel like I didn't, I'm not sure if I answered that that greatly. <laughs> Um, um, sorry, there's just so many great questions. Sorry, those are my rescue dogs <laughs> adopted um, the weekend after the 2016 election. Oh, wow. For the record, that's why I keep turning my camera off because my dog keeps disrupting me. <laughs> you know, they keep they keep barking like it was like, oh my god, we lost. Save the dogs! Save yes, the dogs! But mother, one thing. <laughs> not technically yours because I've never right. seen it. So if you already work in politics but don't have hi. Um already work in politics but don't have campaign experience, would you recommend leaving DC to work on a campaign? Oh gosh. Um Yes and no. I'm like, let's talk. Um, I think it kind of depends on what you can afford, where you are in your career. Um, I really do think that some of the best campaign, again, it, there's so many variables and I, I know, but I think some of the best campaign experience is um, our democratic primaries and like state ledge districts um, and below. Again, because you kind of get the experience of all of it um, and the decision making and the budgeting and campaign message and all of those things on a much smaller scale. But I think that is some of the most um, valuable experiences. I mean, other than that, I would say um, DC is, is good. I would, I would maybe even think about an issue campaign where you um, have a chance from a headquarter operation um, to put more of the campaign components together. Well, this has been really great. I'm going to turn things over to Amy to close out. Thank you. Yeah, we did have a few more, so maybe we'll send them to you. And some of the folks, if you don't mind sharing your contact, we will definitely connect you to some of these folks. So they definitely have some really good specific questions. Um, so first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love seeing you. Um, I miss seeing you. I miss seeing all my friends. That's part of my selfish motivation of doing these is just getting to see my friends. Um, but um, I appreciate, I really do appreciate you lending your time. I know how busy you are. Um, I'm always happy um, to engage new faces so, um, and voices. So Josie and Aviance, I wanna thank you too as well. Um, it's really good for me not to be the one doing these interviews for all sorts of reasons that include like, I have this temptation to answer the questions myself. Um, so you should see some of my, I'm like, oh, I wanna jump in here. And, but I think it's really important to um, hear these voices. One of our goals is to diversify and demystify um, the work that we do. Because I think that in so many ways, our industry is very opaque um, for lots of reasons that are not necessarily by design, but just, um, 
I think people really don't understand all the opportunities. And so we've definitely been seeing these patterns of questions. Obviously, people are entering for the first time or early uh, in their careers. And then we have a ton of people who are coming into the space, you know, in their 30s and their 40s and older who really want to make an impact in advocacy and politics and don't know how to necessarily break into it. I knew he'd make an appearance. Here's Bruno. Um, so, um, you know, it's really nice to hear from you um, on this. So I, like I said, just appreciate it. Um, I appreciate all of our attendees. We've had, it's been interesting watching. We definitely have some people who've been really watching all of these and others who are just coming in and out because they obviously care very specifically about who, um, who is telling about their, their career experience. And I think this is always a really just fun opportunity to listen to. Everyone wants to know, right? How did you make the choices? How, what were the things that you did? Um, and what are the opportunities, especially now as we get closer to election day for folks who are already on campaigns, what do they do after it, no matter what the outcomes are. Um, so this is a fun series for us. So I really appreciate you and I appreciate all of our participants and attendees and panelists. And like I said, this has been a really fun series. Um, so thank you. And I hope folks sign up for others that we have coming up. We've got I think Chuck Roach is joining us next week and talking both about his journey and his new book, um, which I actually just finished reading. Um, and uh, you should read it, by the way, if you haven't. Really good, I was gonna say. Um, and, uh, and sign up, like I said, we're gonna be doing um, more of these and also just talking about different ways to engage in this election. We're really excited about this new platform. It's a, um, as Allison said at the beginning, it's a really uh, new and different iteration of what had been an organization that had been around for a long time, Democratic Gain, and we are much more focused now on not just jobs and career opportunities, but really being a marketing platform for uh, the organizations, for the campaigns, for the consultants, for the products, for the services, um, for everything that we do in our space. It really hasn't been a place that aggregates sort of our progressive world together in a real, um, in a place to commingle. So we've got a lot of exciting things after the election as well. Um, anyway, we're running over late. I don't want to keep people mindful. I'm sure your kids are dying to get to you too. And I'm sure you probably have five more Zoom meetings after this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And see you soon, I hope. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.